vibrate or something that doesn't make noise. Try to have as few interruptions as possible. I'd like to welcome all of our regular members and a, and a, a special welcome to all of our visitors that are here today. If you are visiting, you are our honored guest and we thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule being here. We pray that the things we say and do and the songs we sing will be uplifting to you. And we're going to start things off with a quick song as everybody gets going. <clears throat> Find one that I don't butcher up too much. Hope everybody's doing well. All right, 1097 in the, in the yellow books, 1097. We shall assemble. <clears throat> My throat's a little scratchy, so bear with me. 1097 in the yellow books. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the Good morning. Let's pray. Holy Father, only you are holy. And that we know that we're only able to speak to you through and because of the sacrifice of your Son and, and our Savior Jesus. Lord, we know that your guidance in our, our lives um, is critical and, and, that, and that alone uh, on this earth we are are useless Lord we ask you to be with those that are that are suffering and to comfort those who are in need and uh, Lord we ask you to help us to support those brothers and sisters and uh, this community in such a way that it will be will be beneficial to your work and it will help to further your work Lord we we pray especially for, uh, for our brothers and sisters down in Texas that experienced a shooting this morning, we ask you to be with um, that group, uh, that congregation, and uh, uh, just give them comfort and, uh, and support as they need. Lord, we ask you to be with uh, this congregation as we move into the new year. Let us be, uh, let us be effective in the things that we do for you. Lord, we ask a special blessing upon the AIM students and the mission teams that we have out. Be with them, keep them safe, let their work uh, be something that's beneficial. Lord, we ask you to be with us as we open this service this morning. Let us uh, focus uh, our minds and, uh, uh, and the song service and uh, the things that we do this morning on you. And it's all these things we ask in your in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Very glad that everyone is here today. We're going to sing number 416, What a Friend We Have in Jesus This Morning. 416. for me to read. Okay, 416. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. 
sing number 426 I must tell Jesus number 426 we'll sing this one for our second prayer <clears throat> mm -hmm. I must tell Jesus oh one second one second let me I've got two songs that are very similar give me a second I must tell Jesus all of my trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone, in my distress he kindly will help me, he ever loves and cares for his own, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, All right, thank you. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I am but he will deliver. Make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus. Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. 
second prayer and then scripture all things are possible if we follow the Lord we come now to you with prayer for who are ill or in need of your divine power and wisdom to help them through these times for they look to you for strength and comfort in their time of need in all things that are of your making and power to see us through this life until we can see you in glory and be with you always. In Jesus' holy name, we give thanks and prayer. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 43. Mark 14, 43. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. After waking up the his, uh, three apostles, Peter, James, and John, three times as they were sleeping when he was wanting them to pray. And this is where begins the chain of events that leads to Jesus' crucifixion. And immediately, while he was still speaking... Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a saying, a sign saying, The one I shall kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Master, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest, And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes were assembled. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, and their witness did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet not even so did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he was silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, Why do we need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. 
what is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him and saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the maids of the high priest came and see, seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you were also with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the maid saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. After a little while, again, the bystanders said to Peter, certainly you're one of them for you're a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the cock crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. We'll sing number 473 before the Lord's Supper this morning. Break thou the bread of life, 473. <clears throat> Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. story about how I ended up at, up here at this time. Um, Rocky and Aaron kind of know that if they need a place filled on that list that the men sign up of, if you've never seen it, they could just kind of put me wherever. So Aaron asked me, told me he had one more list and if he could put my name on it. I was like, sure, whatever. Um, then I happened to ask after what I just signed up for. So he kind of showed me that. And then it kind of got me thinking that a lot of the men in here, I've talked to you about this part of our service, and the whatever answers for almost anything on that list, except this time in our service. There's a lot of men, and I'm the same, we can't whatever this kind of this time in our service. There is a, there is a purpose, a pretty significant purpose to this. So kind of, I don't know if I will change my willingness to serve on that list, but I will definitely limit the whatevers, <laughs> I say. Um, that was just one of those things. Today I wanna address 
One of the most, probably the most popular or the most memorized verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Um, I'm not going to really talk about that verse so much, but I'm going to use it as an outline per se. I'm trying to think of what age a child would be able to quote that verse. But most of our kids and adults, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And we've read that, and we've read that, and there's a couple places I want to talk about on there. For God so loved the world, I won't spend a lot of time on that, because the word world is used several times in the Bible. Actually, if, my, if I recall what I looked at, it said it's used 85 times in the New Testament, mainly used by Paul. But I do want to focus on it says that God gave his only begotten son. And about what that means to, uh, what exactly had to transpire for God to give his son, or for Jesus to be in a position to be given. Especially when Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, that entity gave us everything. So how do I, how does he get in a position to be given? And I came up with a few things. Um, He gave up some rights. For those of you who've been in the military, you often find out quickly. We always let us know that there's a difference between rights and privileges. And for example, just to use the military as a whole, many people think it's a right to serve in the military, and it is not. It's a privilege. Not everybody gets into it. So because you're born human or because you're born in our country, you don't have the right to go serve. It's a privilege to be accepted to it. And that's about all I'm going to get into with the rights and privileges. But, but Jesus gave up some of his rights, some of his power, some of his abilities, however you want to look at that. Or he contained them, limited them. It's a lot of different words. <clears throat> One of the things that he gave up if we turn to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians, I'll be in Philippians, flipping back and forth between Philippians and Isaiah a bit. But he gave up his right to live like God. Um, Philippians chapter 2. Five and six. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, and made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. He also gave up the right to act like God, the all powerful, but he contained it when he was here. Back going back to Philippians 4 7, same thing, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of God. Which kind of fascinated me because last week, I think it was last week, in James read John chapter 1. Starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines out in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It just got me thinking, how does not how does, but just got me thinking of what God had to do to be able to give himself to us. Uh, what he had to do to be able to give Jesus. We also read that Jesus gave up the right to look like God. If you read how Moses dealt with it, Abraham dealt with it, on no man can look up on God and live. But we were able to look up on Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is God. So 
How did he do that? And he gave up his right to look like God. If you look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 2, verse Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has, a, he has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I'll read a little bit more. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. And something else he gave up was he gave up the right to be treated like God while he was here. Going back to Philippians. Chapter 8. And being, sorry, verse 2. Sorry, Philippians 2, verse 8. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it just got me thinking about a lot of different things on what, because if you ask what Jesus did for us, everyone's, well, he died for us. And he did, but it was a lot of work that went into that death. It wasn't an easy thing. The creator emptied himself out to be able to die for us to be able to be born of a woman, to take on flesh, to bleed, to be hungry, to be thirsty, to die. Those are things that Jesus became for us. And as a result of this, going back to John, Chapter 1, verse 12, and tying back into John three sixteen, if we believe that. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in the name, who believe in his name. And that's what we're celebrating now. We are those who believe in his name. We are those who... Let me save my words and Hebrews chapter 2. In Psalms 8, if you wanted to look at a parallel, Psalms 8, 1 through 9, when we're described how God describes us. Psalms chapter 8. Starting in verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. The Lord our God is excellent. Sorry, our Lord, our God, how excellent is your name on earth. But then if we go over to Hebrews chapter 2, we see the same words that were used to describe us 
is used to describe Christ, which goes back to support how much was given up on our stead. Gave up enough to where our creator became just like us. He became man in order to save us. And then that made me think about one of Mike's favorite passages in Psalms 84. Verse 10. For day in your courts is better than a thousand, and I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. But what hit me the most when I looked at what Jesus gave up, if I use this verse and I apply it to Jesus, this talks about how a day in the courts is better than a thousand. I don't know how Jesus would describe giving up a day in relationship with his father. And that's what happened when he died, that he gave up that day. And I don't know if any of you can imagine, what would it be like if I gave up God? But try to as much as my brain can't imagine that. We read how Jesus was with God in the beginning. Before there was a beginning, God was. I don't know what Jesus was before he came to earth. I know he was a man when he came here. I don't know what he was before. I know he wasn't a man when he was in heaven, but I don't know if he was still considered the son of God before he was sent to be the son of God to represent that for us. But as much as he gave up the right to be treated like God, the right to live like God, the right to act like God, so right to look like him, gave up all that up. It hit me when I thought he gave up his right to be with him. In order to fill out, to fulfill the will, he allowed himself to be separated from his father. How do you do that? If you're with somebody forever, how do you separate yourself from that? In John 3, 16, answer that, for God so loved the world that he gave us his son. He allowed that to happen. I don't know if that makes much sense to you guys. In my brain, it makes sense a little bit. But just how much we mean to God that he would sacrifice so much to reunite us with him is my point. And I guess I could have said that in the beginning. But there was a lot that it's unimaginable for my brain in order for us to sit here and worship God, to uh, be considered his children, and just some things to think about. It wasn't a simple process. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. And we thank you for giving us a glimpse of what you had to do to allow your son to come to earth and to die in our place. We ask you to help us to understand it more, but even more than that, to appreciate it, to realize there was a price that was paid for us. We thank you for loving us enough to give everything you had to bring us back to you. We ask you to rest in our spirits now, to guide our thoughts, to guide our actions, to help us to remember your body that was broken for us. and what that means to you and help us understand what it should mean to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We're about to take the cup. For the minds that question whether Jesus was fully man or fully God. He was both, but for those who believed, well, he was just God walking in a man's body. I don't know if God's bleed. I don't really want to get into the logic of that. But the cup represents the blood in one way for us to tell if there's life in somebody. If you're alive, you bleed. And if you're dead, you don't. It's simple. If we're judging it by what blood does. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, which we're about to do, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And it was that death, the crossing over and coming back, that death is what gave us life that restored that relationship. Let's pray. Lord, we approach you again. And we again ask you to always increase our understanding, always increase our wisdom to, uh, as long as we live, help us to be more and more like you, to help our ways to become more like you, to help your ways to become more like ours our ways to become more like yours and to help our thoughts to become more like yours that you guide us all the days you bless us with here to focus our energy into becoming more and more like you in Jesus name we pray amen
This is the time in our service where we've set aside time to give and in pulling thoughts together. We have an idea of what Jesus, what God gave for us. And going back to that verse, for God so loved the world that he gave, I'm convinced that that word gave is not intended that he gave as in he relinquished his rights on Jesus and he became our property. I don't think that's the word. I think the word gave there, another synonym in my brain is he committed for God to love the world that he committed his only son. It's one way to think of that. Jesus was committed to God while he received that kind of giving. But in keeping with that, We came across last week, I think, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, where Jesus is talking about to those who overcome. To those who overcome, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the Lord. And I was just thinking, man, Jesus is even giving up space on his throne for us to sit down next to him for those who overcome. Gave his life, gave up his will, giving up space for his throne, on his throne. And we have an opportunity to, uh, what are we willing to commit? What are we willing to give up for God? What are we willing to keep, commit back to him? We have examples of some of the things that people have committed up to and including their children. We read about Samuel, Samson, who were committed back to God. Um, Abraham, who was going to sacrifice his son because of his commitment to God. And I'm not suggesting we go to that level, but it is an opportunity for us to measure what are we willing to commit back to God. And this is one opportunity that we have to show God what we're willing to commit back to him. Let's pray. Lord, again, we approach you and we thank you for this opportunity to be able to commit, to be able to give back to you, that you provide this opportunity, that you provide this honor and this privilege and right that we are able to give back to you, to contribute to your kingdom and we thank you for allowing our contributions to be turned around again and be used for your kingdom, for your body, and that you have welcomed us, those who believe in your son, into that kingdom. We pray your blessing upon what's collected. We ask you to bless those who are giving. And we thank you in advance for the work that you will do with what's collected. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Before the lesson this morning, we're going to sing number 474, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Let's all sing, if you will, just to give us a chance to keep our blood flowing. Stand, stand. What did I say, sing? We're going to sing. Let's all stand, if you will, to get our blood flowing. <clears throat> Sweet Hour of Prayer. <clears throat> Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care, and bids me at my Father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. In morning we'll be reading from Luke chapter 18 and be verses 1 through 14. Luke 18, 1 through 14. <clears throat> and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on earth? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, 
extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you, Daniel. I think I need an assistant up here like he had. But you didn't let him speak. He had a pacifier in his mouth the whole time. Cast on him, I'll cast on him my every care. We just sang. Do you? Do you give God all your cares? What are you worried about? What are you burdened with? What distracts you? What drags you down? What, what disaster is an expected uh, event looming in, in your future? What, what disaster do you dread or hate or run away from? What, what uh, financial difficulty is in front of you? What health burden is on you? Do you give that to God? We're told to. We're told to give all our anxieties to God, for he cares for you. Give them all to him. He doesn't want you carrying any of them. None. Zero. Jesus says his burden is easy. Take his yoke. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. We're not supposed to be carrying that. And so I thank the songwriter for putting that in there. Casting on God our every care, but I'll disagree with the song leader on the next words. And wait for my sweet hour of prayer. Wait for the sweet hour of prayer. When are you ever supposed to wait for prayer? First Thessalonians 5:16. Rejoice always. 17. Pray without ceasing. 18. Giving thanks to him in all circumstances. Giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Giving thanks in all circumstances. So we never have to wait for a sweet hour of prayer. Today we're going to be talking about prayer. We're going to be talking about the power of prayer. This is a modified lesson I gave a few years ago uh, because I'm, I'm sort of seeing it uh, uh, connected with my need to, to revitalize or redevelop, re-obey. Is that a word? Re-obey? I just made it up. Let's go to our Father. Holy Lord, dear God, thank you so much for all that you do. You are awesome beyond every description. Father, that we would ever hesitate to pray to you is, is, is stunning. And that uh, although we sing about a sweet hour of prayer, that uh, we don't very often sometimes participate in an hour of prayer. Father, help us to be men and women who are hungry for you who desire you, who focus on you, who are driven by your magnificence, your glory, so that something like prayer becomes a much more natural connection for us to be in constant participation with you. Thank you so much, Father, that your word teaches us this over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen. So what did we just read about in Luke Jesus teaches these two uh, stories about prayer, right behind, one right behind the other. And he explains, both of them are explained. This is interesting about these stories. One, I, I know that, the, that the, um, your, your margins or your headline calls it a parable, but parables 
sometimes are understood as, as uh, figurative stories, example stories, whereas this story, I think is, these are both quite real. I don't think, I don't think that these are, um, that these are imagined stories. There was a certain city with a judge and a woman and she kept coming to him. There was a publican. There were two men who went up to the temple to pray. I, I think these are actual stories. And Jesus being God himself, thank you for the reminders, Kirkland, it was, is aware of every town with every judge and every unjust ruling against every woman out there. God knows them all, and so he would have full well known this story. But we're told that this parable is taught to us not about justice, not about judgment, not about relationships between the powerful and the, and the poor, but that we can learn a lesson about prayer. And it's stunning to me. It, it surprises me that this lesson about a woman being mistreated and ignored by a man who didn't even have faith in God becomes a lesson to us on how we're supposed to approach God in prayer. What's the lesson? Don't even have to read the rest of the story because the lesson is told in the introduction. The lesson is that we at all times ought to pray and when should we quit? When should we give up in our prayer requests? Never. Never. I remember once uh, uh, somebody doing a lesson in which they said, well, you should pray about something three times and then stop. They had a good reason. I'm not going to make fun of their reason. The reason was is that Jesus prayed three times in the garden and that Paul prayed three times for his burden, his physical burden to be taken away from him before God says, my grace is sufficient for you. So if Jesus prayed three times and Paul prayed three times, we should pray no more than three times. Except for all the other verses that say keep praying. Don't ever stop. When are you going to stop praying for the lost? When are you going to ever stop praying for your family member who has rejected Christ? When are you ever going to stop praying for your neighbor? When are you ever going to stop praying for the pain that your loved one is undergoing? It's not a, it's not a scriptural teaching. It's an interesting concept, but it's not a scriptural teaching. We should, at all times, we should keep praying. Jesus is the one who introduced this idea that we are to be constant in prayer, and he taught it to us deliberately. And the next parable says that we should not trust in ourselves. The whole aspect of prayer is that it is not us, that we are incompetent, that we are weak, that we are helpless, and to humble ourselves to other people, before other people. Contempt. Huh, did you see that person? Did you listen to that person? You know what they said? You know what they did? You know that per You know that? Stop. Stop treating others. Not you all. You, you wouldn't do that. But we so quickly will treat others with contempt. Judgmental contempt. It interrupts us. It interrupts our mind. It's an ungodly heart. And these two men were doing, or the one man was doing this in prayer. Trusting in themselves in prayer. What a wasteful, what a, what a worthless step to take. Trusting in yourself in prayer. Jesus' prayer instructions then, pray at all times. Never give up. Be humble. Remember we defined humility about a month or two ago. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's seeing yourself as God sees you. Humility is to see the truth of who you are, which includes the precious value that you are, but it also includes the sinful, sinful situation you put yourself in and how helpless you are in that situation, how much you can't do it, any of it by yourself, and you need God. Humility is seeing yourself as God sees you Trust God completely, never your own righteousness. We're supposed to have a pathway of righteousness. And so quickly, we accomplish something. We, we develop a discipline in our lives. And anybody, 
a person of no faith at all with simple determination can develop disciplines. People uh, can develop disciplines to, uh, with all sorts of things. They can stop drinking. They can stop smoking. They can, they can become physically fit. They can, um, all sorts of things that are sin-centered sin and not sin-centered. Somebody who's just devoted and disciplined, personally disciplined enough, can become victorious. No one can be victorious over sin without Christ. No one can free themselves of the guilt and the penalty of sin without Christ. But people can discipline their own lives. And when you discipline yourself and you get really good at something or not doing something, pretty soon you're pretty proud of yourself at how good you're doing. <laughs> yeah. But you know that other person, they're not so hot. We do it all the time. Jesus says, never your own righteousness. Jesus' instructions of, 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 uh, of prayer. Jesus' instructions of prayer. We're going to go to, to uh, Ephesians 6, but I want to do so with uh, a, a, a quotation by Oswald Chambers. Prayer does not prepare us for a greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Prayer does not prepare us for a greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And Ephesians 6 will be our proof text for that if you want. Finally, be strong in the Lord, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his, of his might. There are three power words in that sentence. Strong in the Lord, strength and his might. Three different words talking about strength or power or, or uh, uh, the, the, mag, the magnitude of God's effect on things. And we are called to participate in that. It's very clear that we are strong not in ourselves, strong not just not in our discipline, but we are strong in the Lord. If we're able to discipline ourselves in anything, it's a glory to God. If we're able to vic be victorious in any way, it's glory to God. If we're able to accomplish anything, it's glory to God. Be strong in the Lord, and the Lord will guide that strength. It's, it's not strong in yourself. It's not strong in your own will. It's strong in Him, His Word, His way, his will, and in the strength of his might. We're strong in his way with his mighty strength. This description, Ephesians 6, the following verses are a description of our participation in this mighty strength. Be strong in the Lord and in his and in the power of his might, says another version. Put on the full armor of God. We should always remember the maturity and the calling of these verses. Every man, every woman, every baptized believer is called to put on God's armor. It is not our armor. It is not something we have to fabricate. It is not something we have to find. God has it. He owns it. And he provides it to us. It is his armor for us to put on. You can imagine, imagine David uh, and Saul, uh, David uh, going out to get to, to, to try uh, to uh, face Goliath, and Saul puts on puts his armor on David. It doesn't fit. It's in, it's ineffective, and it gets in his way. But it's not David's. It's it's the king's. We have the king's armor, but it fits. It's effective, and not only does it not get in the way, it is the power of the fight. Same concept, not your own armor. You're getting it from the king, but a very, very different conclusion. So put it on. Put it on. You pick up the sword of the Spirit. You carry the shield of faith. You have the breastplate of righteousness. You have the helmet of salvation. All of this is provided for you. You have the belt of truth. 
And you have your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. You are the warrior wearing God's armor. Now, you might think this looks awesome. You might think this looks silly. Doesn't matter. It's just an image. But it's similar to the image that God calls us to have. He doesn't give us this imagery for nothing. We understand what armor is. And in those days, an armored soldier was a, a, a warrior indeed. So many soldiers came uh, in their attacks by the hundreds wearing just barely anything uh, of a, a few pieces of clothing and a woven shield, maybe uh, a short sword, a spear. But they were vulnerable. Only the most mighty warriors. This was like a tank in the early uh, a, a type of combat they had. This is a, 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 a foe indeed. This is a warrior, tough to deal with in battle because he is so powerfully protected. And of course, our armor is God's armor. Now, this is the, this is the scene you want to see if you want an image of it. Not this one. What's the mistake of this image? He's running. This image, he's doing what the scripture says to do. This image, he's running. Let's read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the steam schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the authorities of, the, excuse me, against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with, with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having, put on, having your feet fitted with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Four times, four times we're told what to do or, or how to conduct ourselves, I should say, with the armor on. Verse 11, you may be able to stand firm. Verse 13, after having done everything to stand firm. Verse 14, stand firm, therefore. Over and over and over again, we're told to stand, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Our instructions while we're wearing God's armor is to stand firm. You've got to put it on. Remember, notice who our enemy is. Our enemy, our enemy is Satan. His warriors, his demons... The spiritual forces of evil, the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. Flesh and blood, people, they are not our enemy. They are not our struggle. We do not fight against people, any people. We do not fight. We do not push away people. We do not uh, 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 disregard people. We do not fight with people. We fight against Satan. We fight against his lies. We fight against his demons. We fight against his temptations. We do not fight against people. We'll be mentioning it in a little bit. There was a church shooting in Texas this morning. I don't know the details. It says two men were dead. The West Freeway Church of Christ in White um, Settlement, Texas, Somebody came in, we stood up during the Lord's Supper and started shooting. It was a, apparently a congregation member who stopped him from shooting. 
with a bullet. But that man may be dealt with appropriately that way, but that man is not the enemy. Even in that sort of a violent confrontation, he is not our enemy. And he is not against whom we struggle. That man was giving in to the one we struggle against. Jesus says, you're preparing yourself to stand. Stand where? Wherever God puts you. You stand. Women, you stand. Men, you stand. Teenagers, you stand where God has put you. In your home, you stand. You stand for the Lord. You stand in his word. You stand in faith. You stand in confidence. You stand in joy. In his church, you stand in unity. You stand in fellowship. You stand in love. You stand where God's put you. At work, you are a light in, the, in darkness. You are truth in a world full of confusion. You stand at work. You stand at school. You stand in the marketplace. Wherever God puts you, you stand for him. We're people warriored by God to, to stand. And our activity? Our activity? Our activity is prayer. With all prayer and petition, verse 18, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given me in the opening of my mouth, writes Paul. Pray, 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 pray. There's like six of them in there, and only have five up on the wall. The actions of this warrior is prayer. Now, you've never, hardly ever heard me use the phrase prayer warrior. I don't like catchphrases. I don't like cute phrases or whatever about our Christian faith. A, a prayer of Jabez and, and those sorts of fads that come and go in areas of Christian faith. Um, I, I, I don't go for them. Just, let's just follow the word. Here's what, how the word describes us. But I've got to repent a bit about this one. Because as you get into this, this man is, this, this woman is wearing God's armor and she's standing where God has put her. And she is a woman of prayer. As God's soldier, she is praying and praying and praying and praying. I wish, I wish I could, I could, could tell you about Mabel Howe's enough for you to be in awe of her as, as I am, as Carol is. A woman who at the end of her life, she was so devoted to, to, to the Lord's church, she was so devoted to prayer. When she couldn't speak, she was constantly in prayer for you. When she couldn't move, she was in prayer for you. But that's because she had a life of prayer that built up to that time. Even in her most invalid situations, she was joyous and welcoming. And you felt when you visited her that you had been lifted up. You'd been encouraged and you came to encourage her. She was always praying for you. And I bring her up uh, because my, my, when she passed away, I thought, who's going to pray? Who's going to fill in well, her shoes? Who's going to take Mabel's place and, and pray for us? She was constantly going through the bulletin and saying your names and the directory and saying your names in prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. And I don't want, I don't want to be cute with any phrases, but I wouldn't hesitate calling her a prayer warrior. Men who pray with God's armor on, warriors. In God's battle. We don't pray to prepare for something else. Obviously we do in some context. But prayer is our great work. It is what God calls us to do. Jesus calls us to be in constant prayer. Paul writes repeatedly about their constant prayer, him and his companions, and us to be constantly in prayer. Pray without ceasing. 
praying always, giving thanks in all circumstances. We are to be people in constant prayer. Prayer is the greater work. You bring the power of God into a situation, you've done a lot. Well, God knows what's needed. Why does he need my prayers? He needs your connection. He needs you to be changed. Prayer is powerful. You see, when we get this right, we think we got to worry about stuff. We got to burden ourselves with stuff. We got to carry stuff along. Paul, God says, no, you give it all to me and you pray to me to watch over the things in your life. You submit to me. You humble yourself before me and you humble yourself before the people around you. That You can be focused on prayer. Never arrogant in your own responsibility. Never arrogant, well, I'm worrying about all these things. Never arrogant in your own focus, your own, your own connections, but, but humbly trusting that God will take care of it and you give it to him in prayer constantly, constantly, constantly. Stand, 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 stand. Pray, 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 pray. That's the life of a warrior. Pray for all the saints, he writes. Pray for all the saints in verse 18. I have your prayer list. I've said this before, but I'm getting a little more serious. This is your prayer list. It's the Valley Church Directory. There's 130 families on here, something like that. And of course, every one of those families has multiple members. Wouldn't it be terrific to on the 1st of January take uh, David Aguilar? David's moved on. Pray on the 1st of January for David Aguilar, all of us. And on the 2nd of January, pray for Bill Allen, who hasn't been here in more than a year. And on the 3rd of January, pray for his wife, Carolyn Allen. Or you could take 10 a day and do, do the list in a month. Three times. Or you can sit down for a few hours and go through every name in here and pray for every one of your brothers and sisters. Paul said so. He said pray for all the saints. Pray for all the saints. Who in here doesn't need prayer? I know. What a ridiculous question. Truly pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for each other. Teenagers, stop what you're doing. Don't leave it up to mom and dad. Grab your own directory and pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't even know these people. <laughs> All the more reason to pray for them. And you know what you can pray for them about. You know what you can do. I was going to walk back up there. I'm not going to do that. You know what you can pray for them. You can pray for their faith. You can pray for their knowledge of God. You can pray for their walk. You can pray for their hearts. You can pray for their love. You can pray for their relationship. You can pray that you can find them and talk to them and say, hey, I was praying for you. What a great introduction to a conversation. Hi there. I've been praying for you. How are you doing? Pray for all the saints. I told you this was kind of a personal lesson. <clears throat> Pray for all the saints. We're about halfway through the lesson. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that too much. Our prayer instructions. Pray at all times. Never give up, never quit, never quit praying, never quit praying. Jesus says, I'm telling you this story about this woman so that you will know to pray <coughs> at all times and never quit, never stop. And he, he uses an unrighteous atheist judge, hard to get a hold of, hard to get to listen to, doesn't care about the woman, doesn't care about her at all. And he uses that extreme human weakness, this person, this awful person, as a, as a position 
of our appeal to our loving Father who knows you and cares about you intimately and, and can do something about every part of your life. Be humble. See yourself as God sees you. Trust God completely. Never in yourself. Never in your own righteousness. Pray for all your church family. Put on the full armor of God. Let's be a family who is fired up, who is excited, who rejoices. We, we, we can rejoice always, not because we're so good at being happy. That's not at all what that verse means. <laughs> we can rejoice always. Always because we know who our God is. Even before he saved you. Even before any of that. Just knowing God. It doesn't matter your circumstances. It doesn't matter how he answered your last set of prayers. It doesn't matter if you're tied up in front of the firing squad and about to be executed. You can rejoice always because of who God is. Now, in Christ... We're, off, we're over the moon. We're, 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 we're infinitely beyond that. You can simply rejoice that a loving, powerful, intelligent, purposed God created the world and gave us his word. Now, once you're in Christ, that joy is, un, is unshakable, infinite. But you can rejoice simply with the existence of God. But for those in Christ who can taste that beautiful relationship, who've been covered by his blood, that joy becomes unshakable. We need no health. We need no money. We need no comfort. We need no love. We need other than God's. We need no relationships. And we are, we are swamped with blessings of love and relationship and comfort and, 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 and places uh, that, that uh, we can work at and live in. We're overwhelmed with that stuff, but it doesn't bring our joy any higher because our rejoicing is simply in God and Christ alone. And you can rejoice always. The church in West uh, Freeway Church of Christ in Texas near, near Dallas-Fort Worth area, they can rejoice this morning. The man, I think, that died was leading the Lord's Supper that morning. Obviously, the family's broken hardly hearted. Obviously, the tears flow. But what a victory to be serving the Lord so diligently, to be focused on him on the cross when you actually breathe your last breath. Because this is not our home. This is not where we're intended to stay. This is simply a temporary place we live to serve him, that we may go to him in eternity. So we rejoice and our prayer should come naturally out of that excitement and joy. Our prayer should come naturally out of that devotion. Let us be people of prayer. Jesus' instructions, Paul instructions, pray at all times, never give up, be humble, trust God completely, and pray. Put on the full armor and pray for your church family. If there's any today who have not tasted that rejoicing salvation, if you haven't been baptized into Christ, if you haven't been been covered by the blood of Christ. The snow outside is a great example. I think it's snowing again. At least it was windy just a minute ago. I can see through the windows from up here. But that white snow, your black sin is transformed by blood into white snow. Whiter than snow you are because of the blood of Christ. What a gift. What a point of rejoicing. Let us be people devoted to prayer, devoted to praying for one another, and, and walking in joy in Christ because of what God has done and who he is. Come forward while we stand and sing the song that Scott has selected. Oh.
seated. Let's pray together. Our dear, glorious, and gracious Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise that, that we can give to you, Father. Your holiness and righteousness and your love, it, in, it endures forever, Father. We thank you for all that you have, have given us. Your ways and your thoughts are so much higher than ours, Father, that, but yet you are still mindful of each and every one of us. You care for, for us, Father. You want to hear from us. Lord, as we reflect on this past year, we have so much to be grateful and thankful, Father, for the difficulties and troubles and trials and the joys and blessings that we have experienced and received from you, Father, we thank you. We pray that we have grown closer to you because of, of these things. And as we look forward to this coming year, Father, pray that you will help us to stand firm wherever we may be in our, in our lives, that we can be humble before you and be focused on doing your work and your will and showing your love and kindness and compassion to those around us that they may experience your great love and your forgiveness, Father. Pray that we may be a people that is mindful of you at all times and and that we may seek you with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength to do your will. Father, we are mindful of, of those in our number here who may not be with us today due to illness or whatever circumstance, Father. Pray that they may be brought back together with us here to experience the the connection and fellowship that we have in Christ. Father, we pray that you may be with those and brothers and sisters in, in Texas who are dealing with this tragic event today, Father, and pray that you may be glorified. Father, as we share in this meal, pray that you will bless that, the food and the, and the time and the connections that we can make with one another. We thank you for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us, Father. We give you all praise and glory, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning again. We're very glad that everyone is here. We want to welcome everyone to the Valley Church of Christ, especially if you're visiting with us. We want you to know that all the visitors are welcome. We're glad that you're here today. Please let us know if there's anything this congregation can do to assist you. When we're done, we're going to eat lunch next door. So everyone, please stick around for that. It'll be in this, not next door, but in the next room. And then Bible class will follow up at 1245. So please, everyone, stick around for that. We have several prayer requests to talk about um, several new ones. This was mentioned, there was a very tragic shooting and um, the West Freeway Church of Christ in White Settlement, Texas. Um, a couple people have been killed. At least one is critically injured as of the last news reporting. Please keep those people in mind in your prayers. And let me remind everyone to please be diligent. Um, if you see someone who's hurting, if you see someone who is lonely, by themselves, if you know someone is struggling with some particular um, um, angst or mental illness, please say something. Uh, people like that need a love uh, to be reaching to them. It's a very complex situation, but please be keeping in mind our brothers and sisters who are suffering. Uh, Jim Wise uh, went to the medical clinic this morning as he was getting ready, apparently dealing with some sort of affection, but please keep uh, Jim in your prayers as he is uh, dealing with some sort of illness. Um, 
Uh, we're very glad to have uh, Mike and Lori Salyer back. Uh, Lori had um, some good successes while she was in treatment down in Houston. We're very glad she's here. And Lori provided, uh, Mike and Lori both provided a thank you note. And she said, thank you all for all your prayers and encouragement during these past few months. We have found many answers. Praise God for that. Had some successful surgeries and procedures. And we'll now continue to trust God with what the future holds. We love you, Mike and Lori. So we're very glad for that. We're very uh, glad that she had some successes down there. We're very glad they're back with us. Um, Derek Berg had a bad fall, slipped on the ice, and broke his arm. He had to have surgery to repair the break. And so he's dealing with that. It's going to be a, a long recovery for him. Alice Thorne is Gary Scan's sister. She's being diagnosed with cancer, and so Gary asked for prayers for her. Uh, Fletcher Collins has had some very um, hopeful and, and positive um, health issue, uh, health uh, uh, results recently, so we're very glad for his healing. We're very thankful for that. Meredith Porter's father, Richard Lawson, continues to have some health issues. He's got a variety of compounding health problems, and so please keep Richard Lawson in mind. He's a brother. Uh, down in down south. There are several other people on a prayer request list. Want to keep all of them in mind and pray for these individuals, our brothers and sisters. Um, we have some needs for the medical, I'm sorry, for medical, for mission support. Um, if you are able to provide some support to missions, please see James Smith. He's our deacon for the mission program. But uh, the AIM program in general is needing support. Paul Watson, we continue to support him in the AIM program. And also Tyrus Galatia, who's been here uh, visiting with us, he is planning to go to preaching school and is seeking support. If you're able to provide support for him or for missions in general, uh, please consider that prayerfully and see James if you're able to provide some support for those individuals. Um, coming up on our calendar, we have several small groups throughout the week, so please keep all of those in mind. We're going to have our traditional New Year's Eve fellowship on December 31st, and it'll start here at the church building at 6 p.m. It'll go until midnight. Um, we'll ring in the new year together. Everyone is welcome to participate in that. Bring your favorite uh, potluck snack food to participate, table games, uh, board games to, sh to share, we do ask no electronic games, no shooting games, don't bring your, your guns. Um, we just want to have a family time of in, 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 intimate games together and uh, uh, not necessarily running around. Um, and also no fireworks. Fireworks are not allowed, so please don't bring in fireworks. If you're going to have children here under the age of 12, please make sure that they have an adult accompanying them. We don't want them to be dropped off and left. This is a time for the whole family. If you have more questions on that, please see me, but it's be a good time together. There'll be a girls, gals, and grannies on the 4th. There's a baby shower for Meredith Porter on the 11th and another baby shower for Valerie Long on the 26th. And then on the 25th, there's going to be a winter dinner here at the church building from 6 to 8, and details will be following on that in the future. So there's a lot going on, uh, lots of ways to fellowship with the brothers and sisters. For the fellowship meal we're going to have next door uh, when I'm done with the announcements, everyone again is welcome for that. We want to remind everyone, um, uh, please consider that there are a lot of other people, so take only what you are able to enjoy, and we ask the kids to go through the line with their parents. Also, we want to remind everyone that we have people with nut allergies in the uh, congregation, so please mark any foods that have nuts in it so they are aware and then we also want to keep everyone in mind of food safety. Um, if you bring a cold food, please put it in the refrigerator. If you bring a warm food, please put it in the ovens. We don't want food left out on the tables for an hour and a half during services. We want to make sure that we don't get any food poisoning issues. Just keep that in mind. And of course, this time of the year with colds and viruses going around, everyone be sure to wash your hands very carefully. So cleanup today is the Crockett, Daniel, Decker, and Delph families. So you're dismissed. Enjoy your lunch.